So continuing on, sorry, I forgot to record the beginning part of this, but it's pretty much just, you know, simple stuff. Uh, here is the double slit experiment. They are sending light through one slit. And what happens is when light goes through a small slit, it diffracts, right? It spreads out. Just like if you ever have, you know, I talked about this before, if you have light in a room and you have the door slightly cracked open, then the light goes through, it doesn't stay in that little narrow beam that's the same width as the crack, it spreads out, okay? It spreads out and bends when it goes around the corner. This is the same reason where if you're nearsighted and you're trying to see something far off, what do you do? You squint. And when you squint, that causes the light to spread out, just like what your glasses do. We talked about the other day, if you're nearsighted, you needed that diverging lens that diverged it and then got it to uh, focus at the back of your eye rather than before it reached the back of your eye. And the same thing with squinting. Diverges a little bit, you can see it. You could also just poke a tiny hole in something and look through it as well. Uh, but it diverges, it spreads out. And so uh, that's what's occurring here through that first slit. It goes through, it diverges, and then we have the same light source going on the two, uh, the two secondary slits there. We could have just used a single laser onto those two, but of course they were doing this before lasers. And then when it goes through, you'll get an interference pattern, kind of like what you see there. Uh, it's just going to be a central bright fringe and then uh, and then some dark fringes occurring and alternating dark and light fringes as you go out. Uh, this is actually the basis for how they make holograms. It's, it's really interesting. It's very, very hard. And I still have not quite figured out in my mind, like I can do the math of them. I still haven't quite figured out how this makes a hologram, but they essentially shine the same laser light from two different angles, interfere it, and you get a crazy interference pattern on your film. And then that interference pattern reproduces a three-dimensional image. Uh, it's pretty interesting because it turns out all the information in a three-dimensional volume uh, is only proportional to the surface area of that volume. And so you can contain like, the amount of information in a three-dimensional space purely on a two-dimensional surface. Uh, if anybody's ever heard that, they talk about like, oh, is our universe a hologram thing? That's what they're talking about because the amount of information contained in it is proportional to the surface area of the universe, not the volume of it. So uh, just FYI. Okay, so, uh, but yeah, you get, you get holograms and you get stuff like that from this. And it's also, uh, can then be used to help identify things, what materials and stuff are. Uh, if y'all ever done x-ray diffraction, anybody ever heard of that? You know, that's this kind of thing, the interference of, of electromagnetic uh, radiation and, and stuff like that. Okay. Um, all right. So shine it through those narrow slits, you get that. This is essentially what's happening. Uh, this is comes from uh, Huygens' principle. It's not exactly the way we should view it, but it's pretty good. The idea is that, uh, with his principle, is that any wave front is simply a combination of an infinite number of circular wave fronts like this. And they just add up to make a nice straight wave front. And so if you send this, through a slit like this, it will cut off all of these ones. And then what comes through is just those circular wave fronts. And that's his idea for why light diffracts going through a surface. So if you have a plane wave, it's essentially just an infinite number of circle waves all right up against each other. And they're gonna cancel out. They're gonna cancel out all in here. They're gonna cancel out, cancel out. And then they just, the only thing that's going to be left is all the little tips of the circular waves. And so then that gives you that plane wave. Um, and so the idea then is when the light goes through these two things, it then spreads out, it diffracts out. And then you see that you essentially, it's like having light coming from two sources. You get light coming from here, light coming from here. And then of course, everywhere that they would meet in the middle would all be constructive interference. Okay, 
if you move a little bit off, and you can see that there, where we have crests and crests and crests all meeting and troughs and troughs all meeting up. But if we move over a little bit, say we put a screen right here, we'd see right there, that point, that circle I just did there, that would be, you know, right here, we've got a crest meeting a trough and they would be destructive interference right there. And so we'd have a dark fringe right there if we put our screen right there that we were shining this light onto. And so if we did that, if we had this screen going, we'd be going, you know, it'd be, it'd be bright in the middle and then dark and then bright and then dark and then bright and dark. And it just kind of taper off like that and then do the same thing on the other side. Bright and dark and bright and dark like that. Okay. Now that I made a big mess of that. So if light was not actually acting like a wave, what would you expect? I mean, if we threw a bunch of, uh, you know, paint or something through here, you would expect to get like a glob of paint here and a glob of paint here. But that's not what ends up happening. We end up with that interference pattern. And so this showed us that light was acting like a wave and not like a bunch of particles. Anybody remember what I said the other day was an example of light acting like a particle and not a wave? That wasn't the example I gave. The orbitals are definitely waves. That's that harmonic stuff. Solar, solar panels, solar power, right? Light, waves can't move things, but yet if we have a solar panel out, light can come in and knock electrons loose and give us electricity, right? They can actually move them. So they, they, they can do both wave things and particle things, okay? All right. Here is our two slit experiment right here. This is ultimately what you want for constructive interference is you want this right here. Um, we really have to go to the next one, but essentially what we're looking at are uh, integer multiples of the path length difference. That's that M lambda right here. And that way, that way it can be M equals zero, plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus three. And that'll give us D sine theta D is the distance between the two slits, and theta is the angle from right between the two slits over to the screen, to the center of the screen there, like how far it up is up from the central bright fringe. And this is a better picture of it. Essentially, what you have to have for this equation to hold is you have to have D be very small, and then the distance to the screen be much larger by comparison. So if this, in other words, if, let's say if this is our screen over here and we call that capital D, you must have D be much, much smaller than the distance to the screen. Under that approximation, the rays of light coming through the slits are very close to being parallel, okay? And if they are very close to being parallel, we can draw these right triangles in and we can figure then out that D sine theta uh, for the path length differences is, which is going to be essentially this amount right there is the difference in path is going to be equal to some integer multiple of, of lambda. For dark fringes, on the other hand, we don't want an integer multiple. We want a half integer. So we have that M minus one half. And so we'll end up with a half integer multiple of lambda. So one half times lambda, one and a half times lambda, two and a half times lambda, three and a half times lambda, so on and so forth, uh, just like that. Okay. Any questions on that? And again, M can be those different ones for, for, for which uh, dark fringe you're looking at, the first one, the second one, the third one. Okay. And so then D sine theta, same thing again, for equaling that. All right. Uh, here's a nice picture of it to, to show you the central bright fringe there in the middle, M equals zero. Uh, and then all your other little dark and light fringes. If you're going up, you can just do M equals one, two, three, four. And then the order of the bright fringes too, plus ones, minus ones, so on and so forth. Okay.
Y'all notice this? Plus the zero one is down. Because if you look at this and you plug in M is one, then you get one minus one half. So you get one half lambda. If you plug in M is zero, you get zero minus one half, which gives you negative one half lambda. So take note of the strange ordering of the dark fringes, okay? Up or down one half of the wavelength. Any questions on this so far? Because I'm seeing some faces that look very confused. All right, so far this is still just like that, the, the speaker problem we did in the last section. We just put some math to it where essentially our speakers are really close together and our listeners are really far away from it. You doing okay with this? Not really? Very hard to tell with the masks on. Silence because yes, you're good or silence because you're so lost you don't even know what to ask. Okay, no. uh, all right. What page are we on, 12? Okay, I'll go back and do some example. I'll do an example here. So here, kind of hard to read. So this one is two friends tune their radios to the same frequency to pick up a signal transmitted simultaneously by a pair of antennas. The friend who is equidistant from the antennas at P receives a strong signal. The friend at Q receives a very weak signal. So that means he's getting the destructive interference. Find the wavelength of the radio waves if D equals 750 kilometers, L is 14 kilometers, and Y is 1.88 kilometers. All right, and assume that Q is the first point minimum. So I drew the diagram up there. You can see where each person is. So this up here is one radio antenna. There's the other one. They have a separation of D. So this whole length here is D. I then have, this is the person that's right equidistance between them, right in between them. That means he's getting constructive interference. That's the person at P. And then that person Q is a distance Y up away from them, which was 1.88 kilometers. I then constructed two right triangles. This one right here, which is going to have a side of length L. That's the distance they are from the, the you know, like from the line between the two towers. This side up here is D over two minus Y because this length right here is half of D. And then we're taking away this length here, Y. So it's D over two minus Y. And that gives me one right triangle, which I use to set up this equation right here, which is just the Pythagorean theorem. Maybe I should use yellow, which is just the Pythagorean theorem. Then I did the other one, which was this triangle down here, another right triangle. And in this one, again, I have a, this side is length L. This side here is going to be D plus Y, or I'm sorry, not D, D over two. That's D over two, and then that's Y. So it's D over two plus Y. And then again, I just did Pythagorean theorem to get that L length there, which is this right here. Okay, so I'm just finding the dis their, each of them's, the, the path distance, how far that guy at Q is from each one of them. So I use, I come down here, I plug in the numbers they gave, got that he's 14.1 kilometers from one of them and 15.1 from the other. Doing Pythagorean theorem there. At that point, I said, all right, He's getting destructive interference. And in fact, they said it's the very first destructive interference. So that means that uh, we know that he is off by half a wavelength in his path length difference, right? So since Q is at the first minimum, then path length difference must be one half lambda because he's half a wavelength off for the first destructive interference. Or that tells me that that one kilometer difference of a path length difference from 14.1 to 15.1 is half a wavelength, and therefore a full wavelength is two kilometers.
Easy peasy. This one's a lot like the speaker problem, right? All right. Um, I think the next one is something we haven't talked about yet. Okay. So there we go. So here we can talk about interference in reflected waves. So what happens is waves can reflect back on themselves and cause interference. Uh, you've probably seen this in soap bubbles that look all rainbowy or on a rainy day, you stop to get gas and there's gas that floats up on top of the water and you see the rainbowy color. Uh, if you have a general idea of how thick a thin film is, you can use this to actually uh, figure out what the actual thickness is. You have to know already pretty close what it is because you're going to get the same results if, if you move up full, you know, if you move up by integer multiples of the wavelengths and such, or I guess half integer multiples of it. Uh, but you can do it if you have a general idea how thick something is. Uh, but basically, the idea is we can have a phase change or a no phase change with a reflection. And it's very similar to the phase change or no phase change for the for the wave that was on a on a rope. When we had the free boundary, right, when it was hooked loosely around the pole and it could go up and down, it could react to the wave that came in, we got a non-inverted reflection. When it reflected off a fixed boundary that couldn't react to the wave coming in, it reflected inverted. It's the same sort of thing here. Remember that high index of refraction means low speed. This low index of refraction means high speed. So if you think of this, I think of this as a free boundary because the medium that your light is going into can react quickly because it has a very high speed. It can react quickly to that ray to that wave and therefore reflect it non-inverted. In other words, no phase change. A crest will reflect back as a crest and a trough as a trough. Okay. If you look at this other one, this lower index means high speed. And this one over here, high index means low speed. That to me is like the fixed boundary where the very fast light comes in and bounces off and leaves before the low speed one can react like the fixed boundary, like it bounced off a fixed boundary as far as it was concerned. And so it will reflect with a half wavelength phase change. That means essentially inverted. It flips over and gets inverted. Okay, and that's a very important idea here for deciding what kind of interference we get when it's bouncing off of, of, of thin, thin films or thin surfaces. So. There is no phase change when light reflects from a region with a low index of refraction. So from high index, coming in in a high index and bouncing off a low index. And there's half a wavelength phase change when light reflects from a region with a higher index of refraction or from a solid surface here. Uh, there is also no phase change in the refracted wave. Okay, refracted waves. When they bend, there's no phase change. So the one that the one that transmits through does not have a phase change occur. It only occurs on the reflection. Okay, so take a look at this. Uh, this here is the idea we have got two pieces of glass and at one edge you let them touch at the other edge you put something very thin between them like a piece of hair. And you make it very thin. And then what happens is you get a little gap in between them. Now, there's also there, there technically is some reflection up here and there and there's some reflection down here, but that's not the major cause because the distance between here and here is so small. That's where we're going to get the major interference occurring. So that's the one, only one we're really interested in. The interference are coming from, you know, here with here is too far apart. This glass is too thick. It's not going to make a big difference. You have a very thin gap in between them, in the two surfaces that are closest together. They're going to be the major con uh, contributing uh, interferences for what colors we will see. But basically, as we see this, we'll see 
an interference pattern. If we say the distance between the two uh, uh, between the two services is lowercase letter d, we have two types of interferences that occur here. First, we have constructive interference. You can go through and do this geometrically if you want, uh, but basically, and again, I'm used to this being uh, more like this: two d lambda equals m minus one half. So we're off by half a wavelength here. And the reason we want this to be off by half a wavelength for constructive interference is because we're getting a phase change on one of the reflections, but not the other. So if you think about it, the first one here, this has no phase change, but this has a half wavelength phase change. So we now need them to be off by half a wavelength, right? Because if there was no phase changes at either one, we'd want constructive interference to occur when we had crest meeting crest, and we'd want it just to line up as a full wavelength difference. But now one of them, that crest became a trough. So if they're off by a full wavelength, that's destructive interference. So in order to get them back in phase, they have to be off by half of wavelength here. That's because we have one phase change occurring. If we had two phase changes occurring, then these two equations would flip-flop. So you have to pay attention to how many phase changes you have. If you have one phase change, then your constructive interference occurs when they're off by half a wavelength. Does that make sense? Because the phase change makes them off by half a wavelength. So you need them off by another half of a wavelength. Yeah. Nope, it's just, yep, it's just a single phase change. Yep. So the one that's reflecting off of this surface. So like we have this right. So you could really pretend it's coming in straight, right? These angles are greatly exaggerated. So you have one light ray come in and reflect back. And then another piece of it goes through and reflects back here. And then it's essentially the reflection off of this surface is interfering with the reflection off of that surface. All right. So yeah. that you can't have just a single reflection. You have to have two reflections. So it, it just depends. In this situation, because we have one phase change right here, we have one phase change down here and no phase change up here. For constructive interference, the phase changes put them off by half a wavelength. So we need them to be off by half a wavelength on path length in order to get back to constructive. You mean if we had two phase changes, then we would, then this would be our constructive interference equation. They would flip because you'd need them off by a whole integer. Because if you look at this one, subtract one half from both sides, you get 2d over lambda equals m. The destructive one is off by a full wavelength. I don't know why they don't give them to you in this form. I don't know why the book uses that other form. I don't like it as much. however many phase changes have to occur. If one phase change occurred and you're looking for constructive, then you need another one, so do the minus one half. If two phase changes occurs and you're looking for constructive interference, then you're gonna use this one. Um, it depends on what order numbers you're using. If I start with zero, then I'd want like M plus a half. If I'm starting with one, I want M minus a half, which is what tripped me up on that other one. That because I used my old version from the last textbook I was using, which was a plus half, but this book is using a minus one half. So yeah, just be careful about which version you're using. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay, so be careful with that one. And then the same sort of thing here occurs with thin films. This is like coming off of a soap bubble. Oh, I guess I can pause it. Take a look here. This is a this is pretty quick. This is a human hair between the two wedges. And it asks you to figure out what the thickness of the human hair is. And they tell you there's 179 bright fringes. That means 
we're going to have 179 bright fringes all the way out. Dot, dot, dot. This is where the 179th bright fringe occurs, is over right next to the human hair. So I used M equals 179. I used the wavelength they gave me. Okay. And then I just said, solve for what D is, because however far apart they are at that edge is what the thickness of the human hair is. And so I use the constructive interference version, one half plus the 2D over lambda equals 179 and just solve for D. All right, those ones conceptually a little tricky, mathematically pretty simple. Don't overcomplicate the mathematics. Once you do the, once you do the concept, decide how many path length differences there has to be, count them up. The phase changes can, you know, one phase change means constructive needs to be off by half a wavelength. And we're going to have that same sort of thing when we start talking about the thin film, which is the one I was working on before I got interrupted. So, okay. That's it, y'all. Have a great day.